September 1984. At around midnight, a ship named Valhalla sailed out of Boston's harbor. On board were several tons of rifles, shotguns, ammunition, grenades, and bulletproof vests. The mission? Get these weapons to the Irish Republican Army, or IRA in Ireland, as soon as possible. The IRA was a paramilitary organization fighting for Ireland's independence from the British. And the person who sent this armed shipment to the IRA? A man named James Whitey Bulger, Boston's most notorious crime boss. The story of James Whitey Bulger is insane. Not only was he a ruthless killer, but he was a ruthless killer that had the protection of the FBI. A decade earlier, Whitey had made the sweetheart deal of the century with the FBI. Whitey was supposed to provide the FBI with insider information about the Italian Mafia, who both Whitey and the FBI wanted to take down. And in exchange, the FBI wouldn't go after him. That was how this deal was supposed to go. But in reality, it was more like the FBI was protecting Whitey Bulger as he killed off his enemies and took over Boston. They shooted him from investigations by local police. They let him know when someone was about to rat on him so he could take care of that person. Basically, this crime boss had the FBI in his own pockets while he was allowed to run his criminal enterprise as he pleased. And with all this protection by the FBI, he thought he could get away with international arms trafficking too. To pay for the weapons, him and his associates extorted hundreds of thousands of dollars from local drug dealers. With the weapons in hand, now all they had to do was get them across the Atlantic Ocean without getting caught. The plan was to have the Valhalla ship transfer the weapons to another ship along the way and then return to Boston. But things didn't go as planned. Thanks to a tip-off, the Irish Navy caught the second ship off the Irish coast and the weapons were seized. And the Valhalla? It headed back to Boston, straight into the hands of custom officials. They immediately began interrogating the crew. In Whitey's eyes, something wasn't right. How did the Irish Navy know exactly where and when to catch the ship? And how did they know what was on board? There was only one possibility. A rat. And Whitey's eyes went straight to one man, John McIntyre a mechanic and drug smuggler that was a part of the Valhalla ship. If John McIntyre did indeed rat Whitey out, Whitey's deal with the FBI could be in jeopardy. Running a gang was one thing, but supplying a designated terrorist organization with weapons? That would be something not even the FBI would be able to protect Whitey from. So Whitey and his crew lured McIntyre out with a party invitation to their house. Once he arrived, they dragged him to the basement, chained him to a chair, and then the interrogation began. I think you're a rat. Are you a rat, Johnny? Whitey asked McIntyre. And with a devious smile on his face, Whitey began breaking the man's fingers one by one until he finally confessed. Yes, McIntyre did in fact tell the cops everything about the Valhalla and the weapons. He apologized for being so weak and begged for forgiveness, but it was too late. After a few hours of torture, Whitey asked him, you want a bullet in the head? Unable to go through another round of torture, McIntyre nodded and Whitey shot him point blank, ending his misery. His crew dug a hole, buried the body, and went home. And that was just the beginning of Whitey's murderous rampage. But none of this was the shocking parts. The shocking part is that when Whitey Bulger was in his 20s, he never killed or tortured anyone. He was just an ambitious hustler trying to make money on the streets. But that all changed when Whitey Bulger was sent to prison, where he went through an extremely traumatic event. A traumatic event so extreme that it broke him down and took him to quote, the depths of insanity, end quotes. And when he finally came out of it, he was no longer the man he once was. No, now he was a ruthless, cold-blooded killer. What sort of traumatic event turns a man into a complete psychopath like this? While in prison, James Whitey Bulger was a part of the CIA's Project MK Ultra, where the CIA drugged and tortured their test subjects, all in the name of mind control. Yes, one of America's most notorious killers was a product of the nation's very own intelligence agency. My name is Jake Tran. I make documentaries on money, power, war, and crime with my team. Subscribe for more. If you want to win $1,000 cash, all you have to do is follow me on Instagram at Jake Tran and you're automatically entered. A few of you have won already. Watch out for fake accounts. I would never message you asking for money or to invest. And this is Whitey Bulger, Boston's most notorious crime boss. If Wadi Bulger were still in business today, he would be taking his online security extremely seriously, and for good reason. But you definitely don't need to be a criminal to take your online security seriously. Your personal information is littered all around the internet. It is everywhere. And data brokers love to take advantage of that by selling your data to the highest bidder, all without you ever knowing about it. 
The problem is that the more your data is sold off, the higher the chance that you'll be a victim of a data breach. And it's way more common than you think. In 2021, over 100 million Android users had their personal information leaked. That same year, 93% of the users on LinkedIn also had their personal details for sale online after a data breach. So if it can happen to these giant companies that we all know, it can definitely happen to all the random businesses your data brokers sell your info to. And when it does happen, your full name, social security number, spending habits, and even your home address is up for grabs without you ever knowing about it. And even though you have the right to request data brokers to delete your info, it can literally take years. Thankfully, that is where Incogni comes in. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf and gets them to remove your personal data to protect your privacy. And it's all automated. Here is how it works. First, create an account and give Incogni some info about yourself. Then you want to grant Incogni the right to work for you so they can contact the data brokers on your behalf. And then boom, sit back, relax, and Incogni will take it from there. They'll deal with the data brokers and keep you updated on their progress every step of the way. It's really that easy to protect yourself and your family's privacy. And right now, the first 100 people to use the code JAKETRAN with the link below will get 20% off Incogni. So pause the video and go to incogni.com slash JAKETRAN with the link below to get 20% off for the first 100 people. Thanks to Incogni for sponsoring this video. Nicknamed Whitey due to his blonde hair, Whitey came from the projects in South Boston, locally known as Southie. Southie was more or less an isolated Irish ghetto. As a teenager, Whitey began to build his reputation as a thief and street fighter, and it wasn't long before he got into trouble with the law. At just 14 years old, Bolger was arrested for the first time for stealing. But instead of being scared straight, he just became more determined to live a life of crime. After a failed armed robbery, Whitey was sent to a juvenile detention center, but even they failed to straighten him out. Whitey was a diehard Southie, and he knew the only way to make it in South Boston was to get to the top of the criminal underworld. But then, in a strange turn of events, Whitey joins the Air Force at age 20. Maybe he thought he could get out of crime and make a name for himself doing something good, something legal. But no matter how hard he tried, he simply couldn't hide his violent streak. After getting into several fights, Whitey spent time in the military prison and was later arrested again for going absent without leave. After only three years, his career in the Air Force was over. Whitey was back where it all started, back on the streets of South Boston. But this time, he wouldn't try to do anything better with his life. No, no, no. This time, he would stick to what he was good at, crime. And as expected, where Whitey went, the cops and jail time were never far behind. In 1956, at just 27 years old, Whitey was arrested and sentenced to several years in prison for armed robbery of a bank and a truck hijacking. It was Whitey's first time in federal prison, and in 1959, he even got transferred to Alcatraz, the infamous maximum security prison in the San Francisco Bay. And it was here that Whitey was first approached by the CIA. Offered a reduced sentence for joining some vaguely explained experiment, Whitey didn't think twice about what he was about to get into, but it would become a choice that haunted him for the rest of his life. It was at the height of the Cold War, and the USSR and America were throwing everything they had at each other, besides going to full-on physical war. And one of the tactics America accused the Soviets of using in this war was mind control. Yes, you heard that right. Mind control. The CIA believed the Soviets had figured out a way to turn everyday people into emotionless, thoughtless puppets that would do anything they told them to. But instead of being horrified by the idea, the CIA was more intrigued. They wanted to know if they could do the same thing themselves. Enter MKUltra, the CIA's darkest projects ever. Basically, the scientists behind MKUltra would test all sorts of drugs and torture techniques on as many people as they could. They would try to figure out what combination of these chemicals and psychological or physical abuse would create a completely controllable puppet. Because one of their objectives was to turn their victims into a so-called Manchurian candidate, a programmed killer who would kill on command without any remorse and forget about it a moment later. Someone who would say whatever they wanted them to, even if it meant they would go to jail or be killed themselves. 
The CIA tested its program on everyone, from its own officers to mentally ill hospital patients. And of course, they tested it on prisoners. All they had to do was offer a prisoner a reduced sentence, and he'd agree to almost anything. Plus, who better to turn into a mindless killer to take on the Soviets than someone already prone to violence? And that's where Whitey Bulger came in. The CIA came to Whitey while he was in Alcatraz and told him that they were looking for a cure for schizophrenia. In exchange for joining the program and helping test the treatment, he would get reduced jail time. But it was all a lie. Instead, the CIA used psychological torture and LSD to destabilize Whitey's psyche. They literally took a violent criminal and forced him through a brainwashing program. Whitey later said that they took him to, quote, the depths of insanity, end quote. Joe, how about Whitey Bulger? Oh, yeah. Bro, that's Whitey FBI, Bulger? That's FBI, though. That's FBI. No, no, no. Wasn't he was CIA MK well? Ultra. Really? He was MK Ultra. What does well, that mean? Didn't he have a deal with He the... was in Alcatraz, and they were like, Give him hey, this is for schizophrenia. We're testing this drug. This is going to, it will lessen your time if you do this. Oh, I didn't Dude. know that. Is that he Whitey? Did. Oh, my God. Juror who helped convict crime boss Whitey Bulger feels guilty after learning he was in MK Ultra. Holy sh. Whitey Bulger wrote to a juror who convinced him that he would be dosed with LSD, monitored by a physician, and repeatedly asked leading questions like, like, would you ever kill anyone? No way. Over 50 times. In 1965, after having served nine years in jail, Whitey was set free. But something deep inside him had changed. He wasn't just an ambitious criminal anymore. Oh no. MK Ultra had turned him into something else entirely. It had turned him into a heartless killer. In the 1960s, Boston was dominated by several rival gangs. The Italian Mafia controlled the North End District, and the Irish gangs were in Somerville and Charlestown. They fought over turf, control of local businesses, loan sharking, gambling, and the growing drug market. After his release from Alcatraz, Whitey fell right back in with his old crowd and became a debt collector for the Killeen Gang, an Irish-American gang that had dominated South Boston for over 20 years. And it was during a local gang war that Whitey committed his first murder. His target was a member of the rival gang. But in a crazy case of mistaken identity, Whitey ended up shooting the target's twin brother instead. After realizing his mistake, Whitey panicked and raced to tell his mentor and fellow mobster's house. Whitey told him everything that had happened, but the man didn't seem too concerned. He just said, quote, Don't worry about it. He wasn't healthy anyway. He smoked. He would have gotten lung cancer, end quote. With a gang member's brother dead, the mob war escalated quickly. In just a few days, Donald Colleen, the boss of Whitey's gang, was also dead. Something would have to be done to stop the bloodshed, or both gangs would probably go extinct. There was only one way to sort things out though, and that meant the leaders of the rival gangs would have to sit down and talk it out. They chose a Boston nightclub as their venue. To keep the peace between the two sides, a man named Howie Winter was asked to mediate. Howie was the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, Boston's biggest Irish mob. After hours of talking, the dispute was finally settled, but the gangs went even one step further. Instead of heading back to their separate operations, they decided to join forces with Howie Winter as their boss. With Boston's biggest Irish mob on his side, Whitey Bulger quickly took control of Southeast criminal underworld. He and his associates began shaking down all the neighborhood's bookmakers and loan sharks and they had a pretty sneaky tactic to extort money from people. First, they would create a problem. Then, they offered the solution. They would smash restaurants and bars. And the next day, shocked by the tragic events, they would offer protection so it would never happen again. They would go up to people and tell them, listen, so-and-so wants you dead. They offered us $100,000 to kill you, but if you pay us first, we'll leave you alone. And they always paid. Soon, many of these mobsters were swimming in money, and many of them liked to party and have a good time. But Whitey Bulger wasn't one of them. Maybe it was the after effects of MKUltra, or maybe he had just always been that way. But Whitey just didn't seem to know how to interact with people on a human level. As a result, he was rarely seen at fancy parties or clubs. For him, it was all about business. And he never lost sight of that one clear goal he had in mind, to become Boston's undisputed crime boss. During 
the 1970s, one of the FBI's top priorities was to bust the Italian Mafia in Boston. But to do that, they would need help from the inside. They would need someone who could tell them exactly what was happening and when. And who better to ask than Whitey Bulger? He was connected to Boston's biggest gangs, and he was as dirty as they come. If the FBI promised him a good deal, a chance to stay out of jail for whatever he was currently busy with, maybe he would agree. Besides, Whitey had a difficult relationship with the Italian mob. As the leader of the Irish Winter Hill Gang, Howie Winter had always done his best to keep peace with the Italian Mafia. He simply didn't want to step on their toes. But Whitey hated the fact that everyone had to cater to the Italians. He wanted to shake the status quo. So in 1975, Whitey secretly met with an FBI agent named John Connolly. Connolly grew up in the same South Boston housing project as Whitey, so they immediately had a special connection. During their meeting, Agent Connolly asked Whitey if he could provide the FBI with information to bust the Italian mob. Connolly told him that the Mafia was already doing the same thing to him, so why not fight fire with fire? Here was Whitey's chance to take down his rivals and get into the FBI's good graces. There was just one problem. The unwritten law of the mob was that you must never cooperate with the police or the feds. In Boston, informants had a pretty short life expectancy. Once people knew you were a rat, you were done. If you were lucky, your criminal career was simply over, but more often than not, you would end up dead and buried under a bridge. And as a rule, Whitey hated nothing more than rats. If he was gonna work with the FBI, he was gonna do it under one clear condition. He would not be an informant, but a secret strategist. Agent Connolly agreed. Shortly after, Whitey became a part of the FBI's top echelon program, and for him, it was a gift sent from heaven. For one, he could use the FBI to bring down his major rival, the Italian Mafia. He would provide them with the information, and the FBI would do all the dirty work for him. But the best part was that he would be protected from any current or future investigations. As part of the top echelon program, the FBI shielded their informants from the local police to keep them in the game. So Whitey's informant status gave him virtual immunity. From now on, he could run his criminal empire as he pleased, and he wasted no time taking advantage of this fact. By the late 1970s, only Howie Winter stands in Whitey's way to becoming Boston's biggest, strongest crime boss, and Winter's luck is running out. In 1979, Winter organized a race-fixing scheme at the horse tracks. His gang would bribe jockeys and dope horses to get the results they wanted, but then one jockey got caught and spilled the beans to the police. As a result, Winter was arrested, together with several members of his inner circle. Whitey had also been part of the race-fixing scheme, but thanks to his FBI handler, John Connolly, any charges against Whitey were immediately dropped. With his former boss in prison, Whitey and another mobster, Stephen Flemmy, stepped into the power vacuum and took over the Winter Hill Gang. As the leader of the Irish mob, and with the FBI taking down his Italian rivals one by one, Whitey's business was booming. Loan sharking, truck hijacking, arms trafficking, extortion. His gang had a hand in everything. But then people started getting a little suspicious. Every time the local police tried to open a case against Whitey, they would come to a dead end. When they asked the FBI about him, they were simply told that Whitey was only a small-time criminal. No one to worry about. In return for FBI protection, Whitey made a big show of giving them information on the Italian Mafia. But in reality, Agent Connolly and the FBI were Whitey's informants, not the other way around. Not only did they block any attempts by the local police to investigate them, they also told him when someone was about to rat on him so he could handle the situation, he was simply untouchable. Then, in September 1983, the FBI finally scored a major victory against Boston's organized crime. With Whitey's help, they arrested Jerry Angiulo, the leader of the Italian Mafia. When the FBI arrested him during dinner at a fancy restaurant, he famously shouted, quote, I'll be back before my pork chops get cold, end quote. Instead, he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Local Chief Jerry Angiulo is jailed for a staggering 45 years on assorted charges of racketeering. With the leader of the Italian Mafia in jail and complete protection thanks to the FBI, Whitey Bulger and his Winter Hill gang now had complete control of Boston's underworld. Whitey had gotten what he always wanted. Boston belonged to him. Now it was time to rule his empire with an iron fist.
When Whitey Bulger helped ship the weapons to the IRA, he took a big risk. If they caught him, not even the deal with the FBI could protect him anymore. We're talking about smuggling weapons to foreign countries after all. But next to his career as an international arms dealer, Whitey took another big risk, expanding his drug business. Drug dealers weren't exactly the type of criminals you could trust with your life. If they got caught, they'd rat out everyone to save their own skin. But the bigger problem was that Whitey was challenging another federal agency, the DEA. And just like with the weapons, if the DEA could link Whitey to the drug trade, his FBI informant status wouldn't protect him anymore. And it wasn't long before the DEA agents found someone willing to talk. A South Boston street dealer had lost a huge amount of money in a failed drug deal and could no longer pay Whitey for his product. Fearing for his life, the dealer began to talk to the feds. The result? More than 50 of Whitey's associates got arrested. In an instant, Whitey's drug business was done and the DEA was hot on his trail. Luckily, thanks to FBI agent Connolly, Whitey managed to stay out of jail. Agent Connolly argued that Whitey was still a valuable source for the FBI, but this excuse was slowly wearing thin. More and more police officers and federal agents began asking questions about the deal Whitey had with the FBI. Was he actually a valuable source? Or was it in fact a corrupt deal between Whitey and a few FBI agents? Agent Connolly had grown to like Whitey and even stole reports from other informants and put Whitey's name on them to make him look like a legit source. But soon, their deal would come to an end. In 1990, Agent Connolly retired from the FBI and Whitey's informant status was terminated. For the federal prosecutors and state police, that meant one thing. It was finally time to take down Whitey Bulger. Thanks to Whitey's murdering spree, racking up 11 kills in his time as a Boston mobster, several bookmakers were happy to testify against him and hopefully save their own lives in the process. And so, a federal case was built against him. In December 1994, Agent Connolly warned his old friend one last time, the feds are coming for you, it's time to leave town. A few days later, Whitey Bulger fled Boston and went into hiding. Thanks to Agent John Connolly, Whitey Bulger and his Irish mob had enjoyed exclusive protection by the FBI for over 15 years. For them, the deal with Whitey turned out to be the most embarrassing mistake in FBI history. It was corruption at the highest level of a federal agency. They had let Whitey and his pals get away with literal murder, all in the name of collecting information on the Italian mafia. And in the process, they simply helped the Irish mob take their place. With Agent Connolly retired and Whitey Bulger on the run, it was time for redemption. But if they thought they could catch Whitey by surprise, they were badly mistaken. He had planned his escape for years. He created a whole new identity for himself, complete with an ID and credit cards in his new name. He even had cash, jewelry, and passports stored in safety boxes all over the US and Europe. He had always said you had to be ready to take off on short notice. And when the time came, Whitey was more than ready. For the FBI, it was as if Whitey had dropped off the face of the earth. Over the years, they received tips that people had spotted him from all over the world, including London and Italy. At one point, FBI agents even went to Uruguay to investigate a lead, but they simply couldn't find him. Whitey Bulger had become a ghost. Meanwhile, Whitey's former FBI contact, John Connolly, had to face criminal charges himself. It turned out that some of the tip-offs he had given Whitey over the years had led to murder. So he was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 40 years in prison. But just to make things a bit more difficult for the FBI, Connolly decided not to testify against Whitey. So even though the FBI had Connolly and his other associates arrested, they still had no idea where to find Whitey. And there was a good reason for that. Not only did he keep a super low profile and avoided any criminal activity, but the FBI also didn't have any good pictures of him that they could show to the public. Sure, they had some surveillance footage and a few old mug shots, but Whitey was now over 70 years old, so all these old pictures weren't that helpful. And so, Whitey went dark for 16 years. Charlie and Carol Gasco seemed like your regular friendly old couple next door, enjoying their retirement in a small apartment in Santa Monica, California. 
Charlie spent most of his time watching TV, while Carol would go for walks or visit the farmer's market. Exactly how would you expect a normal 80-something-year-old couple to spend their days? Their landlord described them as the perfect tenants. They never complained and always paid rent on time, and in cash. But some neighbors were a little suspicious of Charlie. He would often wear a hat and sunglasses to hide his face when he left the apartment. And when Carol talked too long with other people, he would yell at them and tell them to get lost. This went way past an old guy being antisocial. Charlie couldn't seem to stand the company of strangers. To make matters worse, at night the neighbors would often spot Charlie staring through his apartment window with binoculars. Yes, something about Charlie and Carol was definitely off. But the weirdest thing about Charlie and Carol? Every day, a piece of paper with the instructions, please do not knock, would appear stuck to their apartment door. And there were good reasons for that. Because Charlie and Carol Gasco, the friendly couple next door, were not who they said they were. The strange, grumpy old man's name wasn't even Charlie. It was Whitey, James Whitey Bulger, America's most notorious crime boss. And Carol, his sweet, friendly wife? She wasn't who she said she was either. Her real name was Catherine Gregg, and she had been Whitey's girlfriend for long before he retired in Santa Monica. While the FBI tried to catch Whitey for 16 years, he had been hiding in plain sight in a modest apartment in California, but his luck would soon run out. After years of chasing false leads, the FBI decided to try a new strategy. Instead of looking for Whitey, they could try to find him through his girlfriend, Catherine Gray. Since Whitey had disappeared, no one had seen or heard from her, so the FBI assumed they were on the run together. And in Catherine's case, they had something they could work with. Like most mob wives and girlfriends, Catherine had gotten several plastic surgeries done, so the FBI reached out to plastic surgeons all around Boston, and it wasn't long before they got a call from a doctor who had found her files. Suddenly, the FBI had a treasure trove of high-quality pictures of Whitey's girlfriend, Catherine. Shortly after, the FBI announced this new search target in 14 cities and doubled the reward for her capture to $100,000. And it worked. Just one day after the announcement, the FBI received several messages saying that the woman they were looking for was Carol Gasco and that she was living in Santa Monica with her husband, Charlie. A database search revealed that Charlie and Carol Gasco were basically ghosts. No driver's license, no California IDs. Apart from a name and a social security number, it was as if they didn't exist. The FBI was positive they had found their man. And a short surveillance operation later, it was confirmed. After 16 years, they finally had Whitey Bulger and his girlfriend Catherine right in front of them. It was time to strike. But instead of storming their apartment with guns blazing, they decided to set a trap. On June 22, 2011, at around 5.45 p.m., the building manager called Whitey's apartment to tell them that someone had broken into their locker in the basement. Someone had to come down to check what was missing. Catherine replied that her husband would come down in a minute. In his prime, Whitey would have smelled the trap a mile away. But Whitey was now 81 years old, and this time, his criminal instincts failed him. When Whitey arrived in the basement, FBI agents immediately took him down. Surprisingly, he offered no resistance. He even confirmed that he was in fact Whitey Bulger. During a search of his apartment a little later, the agents found $800,000 in cash and more than 30 weapons, including rifles and shotguns, plus several fake IDs. In November 2013, Whitey Bulger was sentenced to two life sentences, plus five years for extortion, drug trafficking, and at least 11 murders. For the first four years, he served time in a prison in Florida, but on October 29, 2018, he was transferred to a prison in West Virginia. Less than 12 hours later, he was found dead. Several inmates had beaten him to death with padlocks wrapped in socks. The guards found him with his eyes and tongue nearly entirely ripped out. And one guard described Whitey as, quote, unrecognizable, end quote. After Whitey's death, many wondered why he wasn't transferred to a prison with better protection. Some believe he was deliberately sent to his death. One of the suspects is an Italian mafia hitman who was serving a life sentence in jail. If he was involved, he would have a clear motive, killing the man who ratted out the Italian mafia. Notorious mobster James Whitey Bulger was found dead earlier this week at a prison in West Virginia. A convicted mafia hitman who once lived in West Springfield is a prime suspect. Unfortunately, 
The spot where Whitey Bulger died was conveniently not covered by surveillance cameras, and the inmates involved, they stand firm by their anti-rap beliefs. To this day, the truth behind the murder of Boston's most notorious crime boss remains a mystery. Whitey Bulger was one of the most ruthless mobsters in US history, but even though he had a criminal streak from the beginning, he never tortured or killed anyone in his 20s. That all changed after he was pressured to join the CIA's MK Ultra program in jail. In a private letter, Whitey later said that the CIA appealed to our sense of doing something worthwhile for society, but that was just a false promise to lure him into the program. After he joined MKUltra, the CIA dosed Whitey at least 50 times with mind-altering drugs like LSD. Whitey later said, We experienced horrible periods of living nightmares and even blood coming out of the walls. During the most extreme hallucinations, they would ask him again and again, Would you ever kill anyone? All the psychological torture left Whitey traumatized for the rest of his life. But talking about all the details of MKUltra, the psychological torture, the LSD experiments, and all the illegal brainwashing was beyond the scope of this video. Besides, the vivid details of torture would trigger all kinds of red flags with the YouTube algorithm. Luckily, we've released a deep dive into every dark, evil secret MKUltra holds as a private documentary available only to members of this channel, and they have been loving the documentary. All you have to do to get access to this video on MKUltra right now, and all the other documentary-length videos, they're too controversial, too dark, too risky to post publicly, is click the join button below. Once you sign up, you'll get exclusive access to MKUltra, the CIA coup in Iran, the Bin Laden Papers, Efri Jepstein, and many more, including the upcoming one of the CIA black sites that even we are worried about publishing. These are the things they should be teaching you in university about how the world works, but unlike university, you get all of this for just $5 a month. And there's a refund policy too, unlike most YouTube memberships. So if you join and you don't think it's worth it, email us within your first month of joining and we will personally refund you for your first month. After your first month, there is no refund. So scroll down and hit that join button now. Have you guys seen the movie Black Mass? It's about Whitey Bulger and it's super good. So I'm really happy I finally got to make a video on this. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below. And if you're new here, this is one of the biggest channels on YouTube for documentaries on money, power, war, and crime. We make multiple documentaries just like this one every single week for free. So if you like this one, click that subscribe button below. Remember, you can follow me on Instagram for a chance to win $1,000 at Jake Tran. And if you're on Facebook and you want shorter videos, you can follow our page over there. That's gonna wrap it up. Stay dangerous out there and I'll see you guys in the next one.